come here, we would do uh, debridement, we would uh, teach you how to debride the wood and I do, I train uh, people in Karigiri, you've been to Velo, Karigiri? So we run workshops there for the last 12 years and we do hands-on demonstrations, we do casting and we, we teach people how to do uh, casting. But that's a two-day program, okay? <laughs> so in one hour, we'll see what we can get through, okay? So, how do you want to be involved? How do you, how do you want to be involved? What do you see here? Okay. As I go to the slides, you can probably then join me. So one thing in anything is having the right tools, you know, if you don't have the right tools then it's very hard to do things properly. So. Are we on the slides? So diabetic foot, what's the prevalence of diabetic foot in India? Do you know? Yeah, probably it's about 15%, okay, but of course it will vary from center to center, it will vary people are in the villages or they're in urban areas. There's not a lot of hard and fast data in, in India. Like in, in the UK, we've got the National Diabetic Foot Audit and we don't have that happening in India. It's usually small centers uh, who, who look at, at their database maybe. Even that may not be complete. If you saw my slides this morning, uh, people being referred to the foot clinic uh, f across Europe is, uh, f if, if you look at people being referred when they have a foot ulcer, less than three months, it varies from 6% to 50%. And some of the places in Europe, when I was speaking to the clinics where they had very late referrals, is because it's private healthcare in that particular country. So the patients will not travel 50 miles to see a specialist, okay, pay all that money and then also to pay for the specialist. So they will come for one clinic visit and then they will not turn up for three to four months. So this is the variation in delivery of care that also leads to variation in care. I think that's a lot that happens in India and I've worked in India before I went to the UK and, we, we, and I, I do clinics and ward rounds in St. John's in Bangalore. And it's totally different in how, as you know, how we practice in the UK. So it is different. And, and data collection also is, is probably not that robust here in India. So we don't actually know the exact prevalence of the diabetic foot in India. Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. So what's the most common complication in the diabetic foot? So, yeah, so ulcers is a, is, a, is, a, is a major problem. It is not the commonest complication in the diabetic foot. It is one of the complications. Neuropathy. Neuropathy, Neuropathy can occur in up to 60 to 70 percent of people with diabetes. It also depends on the tools that you use to diagnose neuropathy. Remember, the tools that we use to diagnose neuropathy are actually not picking up people with neuropathy. It is picking up people at risk for foot ulceration. So if you use the 10 gram monofilament, for example, if somebody can't feel the 10 gram monofilament, they have a risk for foot ulceration. Yes, they also have neuropathy, okay? But they probably had neuropathy even before they couldn't feel the 10 gram monofilament. The same also with tuning fork. So when Peter Dick did his work in, in the US, he found that people who were coming to his clinic had a much higher prevalence because they were using nerve conduction studies, okay, which you know is probably more sensitive than just doing 10 gram monofilament or tuning forks. The same also is 
um, is with, with, with using the biothesiometer, which I don't think we have here today, isn't it? No? You have, you have one here today? Oh, right, okay, sorry. Yeah, thank you. So that is also more sensitive than doing a, more, a monofilament. And why is that more sensitive? So if you look at the research that was done with the biothesiometer, and I'll show you some slides later on, the voltage should be more than 25 volts before you say somebody's at risk for ulceration. Okay? And we have to have a cutoff somewhere. Okay? But in you, for example, if I put the biothesis in your foot, at what level will you feel it, you think? Anybody? If you put on her foot, what, what level will, we, will she be able to feel it, you think? Yeah. Maybe five to six volts. Okay? Assuming that she doesn't have diabetes, okay? <laughs> Sorry? If she's normal, not diabetic, then 12 to 15, if she's normal. 12 to 15 is normal, it's actually much lower than that. And there's a nice paper, nice paper from Sheffield where they looked at uh, age and when people can feel the biothesiometer or when they will stop feeling it, I should say, okay? So in young children, probably even one and two and three, they'll be able to feel because their toe, toes are much more sensitive. But if somebody is of your age, but they're walking bare feet, then it may be even 15 or 20 volts, isn't it? Because of the hard skin they develop, okay? So there's lots of factors you need to take into account. So just to make it more consistent globally, we went for a cutoff of 25, okay? So if somebody's got a, a VPT of 25, we say they've got neuropathy. But actually that's a risk for, yes, they have neuropathy, but that's mainly a risk for ulceration, okay? Because somebody who's much younger will feel it at a much lower rate. So if she can't feel 15, I would say she's got neuropathy, okay? But that's not the criteria we use um, in, in clinical trials. So we saw the slide this morning, okay? So I just want to talk about, about these three slides, okay, about these three pictures here. This patient here, what do you think this patient has got? I have to shout, I can't hear otherwise. What's this patient got? Neuropathic ulcer. Okay, anything else? Where would you normally see neuropathic ulcers? On the plantar surface, you know? So this is, so this is on the edge, okay, on the lateral aspect. Yeah, but normally, tight shoes should not cause ulceration, no? If you wear a tight shoe, tomorrow you'll throw it out because it's too tight for you. So what is this part of the foot called? It's the watershed zone, okay? So what supplies the top of the foot? Which blood vessel? Dorsalis pedis. What supplies the bottom? The, the tibialis posterior, okay? So top and the bottom. On the side, you've got the watershed zone where both these arteries meet in capillaries, okay? So when somebody has got your ischemia, that is part of the foot that gets affected. And then, yes, then the shoe causes the problem and then they get ulceration. Normally, if you don't have neuropathy and you don't have PAD, tight shoes should not cause ulcerations, okay? We did a study in people with rheumatoid arthritis and we showed all that they had rheumatoid arthritis, they had foot deformities, not many of them actually got foot ulcers because they didn't have neuropathy. They did, some of them get, because they have severe deformities, they're on steroids, for example, okay. But the prevalence is much, much lower despite having inappropriate footwear or having foot deformities. What about this patient? What do you think happened to this patient? Okay, what caused the gangrene, you think? Hmm? Yeah, so one of them is PAD. So when we talk about the peripheral vascular disease, what surplus are we talking about? Arterial? So we should say peripheral arterial disease. We don't use PVD, we now talk about PAD, okay? Because it then specifies it is arterial, not venous. So when somebody's got PAD, how would you describe it? So you've got the macrovascular circulation and you've got the microvascular circulation, isn't it? People with diabetes, they also get affection of the microvascular circulation more than the macro sometimes, okay? 
and we did a study in, 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 in Manchester where we looked at people with and without diabetes and we looked at angiograms and we showed that people without diabetes mainly affects the femoral artery and people with diabetes affects below knee, okay, the smaller and the smaller blood vessels. So what happened to this patient, do you think? Why did she get... It's not very common to see it like that, isn't it? <clears throat> so one could be emboli, okay? So obviously you want to examine the heart, make sure she doesn't have AF. What else could have caused that, you think? <clears throat> Come again? Acute gout um, causing gangrene? Not gangrene. Ah, yeah. Like yes, correct. So infection, infection can give rise to this. Why, why this can happen? Somebody's had an infected foot. So if somebody's got infection, it can go into gangrene. We call it wet gangrene, isn't it? Why do they get wet gangrene? Why do they get gangrene? It's infection, isn't it? Why does it become gangrenous? Which can cause infection. It can't. It will not cause gangrene. Yeah. So when somebody gets an infection, they get arthritis. Okay. A study done by Mike Edmonds in London. He looked at toes for people who had this and had the toe amputated, and he looked at the blood vessels, and he showed that people who had infection, the blood vessels were blocked. Okay. With 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 thrombi because of the infection. What about this patient here? That's a very sad story. I'll tell you in a minute. So this is a patient who came with fracture of his hip, okay? He was in hospital with fracture hip, and then I was called to see him because the other leg had osteomyelitis and a wound, and they were going to amputate the leg. So he came into hospital, they repaired the hip, he was an elderly gentleman, he lay in bed for, for six weeks, okay? Pressure, okay? So that's another thing in the UK. This is what we call is a never event, okay? Somebody coming to the hospital without a foot ulcer should not get a foot ulcer in hospital. We call it, if they get this, it's called a never event, okay? And this, get, this then gets reported centrally, okay? So this, there are a lot of checks put in place, okay? DKA, for example, if somebody comes into hospital, gets a DKA, again, that gets reported, because that also is a never event. <clears throat> so different presentations of diabetic foot problems. <coughs> So why is it important? And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know all these, uh, these, these figures, okay? It's important because a lot of people have amputations. People with diabetes are greater risk for gangrene and amputations and also complications, but also mortality, okay? Um, and also it's expensive. A lot of money is being spent for people with diabetic foot, and this is leading to a huge drain on the healthcare resources, but also for the patients themselves, if the patient is paying for their treatment. So this is what we call the diabetic foot syndrome, and it sort of goes in this order, because usually people first develop neuropathy. It's not always the case, okay? It goes down this order, the neuropathy, then they get vascular disease, then they get uh, foot deformity, foot ulceration, amputation, and then these patients die, unfortunately, okay? So what we want to do is to try and prevent people progressing downwards so they don't have an amputation, because we know if somebody has an amputation, they will lose the other leg within five years. Okay, so that will have a major impact on quality of life, but also 50% mortality if they have a lower limb amputation. So, these are the five important things that we need to look at when you're looking at a diabetic foot, okay? We want to know what's happening with... What's that B? No, okay. So we want to look at first neuropathy, then look at the circulation, then we want to know a bit about ulcers, then infection, and of course then Charcot foot, okay? Charcot foot is the most devastating complication in people with diabetes. <clears throat> so neuropathy is the commonest complication, like you said, it can occur in up to two thirds of patients and 50% of them will have symptoms, okay? They can have what we call positive symptoms or they can have negative symptoms. Negative symptoms when they have numbness Positive when they have pain, burning, shooting pain, and they can't sleep at night because of the pain, okay? So this is what Paul Brand said, okay? Pain is the gift to mankind, okay? You put your hand in the hot fire, you pull it out immediately, okay? But people with leprosy will, will walk on coals and they don't feel it, okay? Get ulcers, unfortunately, then they have an amputation. 
So Paul Brand first used this term, loss of gift of pain in people with leprosy, and then obviously lepro leprosy causes neuropathy, same like in people with diabetes. <coughs> so first they ex have sensory involvement, very later on there's motor involvement. So usually it is distal, peripheral, sensory, neuropathy. Okay, later on it will become sensory motor. That's quite later on. So the important thing is always uh, taking a good history. You want to ask the patient about symptoms. You want to ask about their glycemic control, um, any history of previous foot ulcerations, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so taking a good history is always important, as anything in medicine. Okay, whenever I go on, my, on the ward rounds and my junior doctor will present to me, I will always take the history again. Okay, because you know from your own practice that a patient comes to hospital, he's tired, he's stressed, he's anxious, he may not give you the full story to the junior doctor. And then when you go as a senior consultant, suddenly he remembers something, or you may ask the correct questions, which the junior doctor who doesn't have the experience may or not ask that question. So every time you see a patient, it is good to ask and take a history again and again and again. Also it reinforces the patient that you care about his condition, because you're again inquiring on how he is and what his foot is doing. Okay, so the assessments, the most common one we use, I think the same also is here, is using 10 gram monofilament. No? So why 10 gram monofilament? How many monofilaments are there, do you know? How many monofilaments are there? Three, yeah, which three? Five, 10, 15. It's one gram, 10 gram, and 75 grams. Okay, if I put the one gram to your foot, you should be able to feel it, okay? But we went for the 10 gram monofilament, just like with the 25 volts on the VPT, we had to come up with a cutoff. One gram is too sensitive for somebody who's in their 50s and 60s. So that's why the research was done with 10 gram monofilament. We never use the 75 grams, by the way, okay? So 10 gram monofilament, we check pain, temperature, and then vibration sense. Okay, so do you want to do the demonstration? Do you want to do it? Okay, so, so the tuning fork, uh, sorry, the, the monofilament, okay? You get lots of monofilaments, okay? But you must be careful that you've got the right one that is giving the right sensation, okay? And the right pressure, I should say. So once you use a monofilament, okay, how many times can you use the monofilament? How many times can you use the monofilament? So if it is disposable, you can use it once, okay? But usually they're expensive. That one costs 14 pounds. I can't throw it every time, okay? But the one that they make in Karigari, it costs 10p. What, that might be a rupee or something like that? Much less, isn't it? Okay, so a monofilm, if you're going to use it again and again, study done in Bristol showed, if you use it in 10 patients, you must not use it for 24 hours because it loses its elasticity. So you're doing 10 gram, 10 gram, 10 gram, 10 times. The 11th patient, it will be eight grams. So what will happen if it's eight grams? You will misdiagnose the patient has got neuropathy, okay? So in my clinic, I usually have two of them. I have about 15 to 20 patients in my clinic, okay? So we have two, so we use it 10, and then I put that in the cupboard, I take out the other one, okay? Make sure you don't use it more than in 10 patients. Can you focus it on her hand now, please? He'll there we go. Okay. You have the mic, isn't it? Yeah. You can, you can, you see. can see? Yeah. So we have to buckle it. So how do you put the monofilament? Always do it in a place where the patient can feel. Okay? There's no point going straight to the foot because he doesn't know what to feel. So all we do on the hand first, okay, and tell the patient with the eyes open, this is what I'm going to do. You touch it, it must touch for how many seconds? Two seconds, okay? And must not shake it, okay? You must just go like she's shown it, touch it, two seconds, take it out, okay? And then do on the foot. Come on, do you want to? Hmm. 
तू डोळे मीठ तुला कळाल्यानंतर एक मन किंवा वन मन ठीक आहे हा हात ठेव खाली आता पाय सरळ कर Excellent. So you can test in 10 sites, you can test in 3 sites, you can test in 4 sites, okay? The important thing is to keep a standard for your particular clinic, okay? So we do it on four sites, okay? So we do on the plantar surface of the toe, under the first, third, and the fifth metatarsal head. Why do the nerves in the feet get affected before the nerves in the hands? Length dependent. Length dependent, absolutely right. If somebody has neuropathy in the hands, and they've got diabetes, I will always think of another cause for his neuropathy. So when would somebody get neuropathy in the hands after they've had neuropathy in the feet? When will they get in the hands? Hmm? No, no, they've got peripheral neuropathy. Now they're getting it in the hands. So when will it affect the hands? After it gets in the feet. After how long? Stand up. Stand up. Come outside. Now put your hand down. Yeah. But how's it reaching? Somewhere near the knee. Yeah? So when it reaches the knee, that's when the fingers start to get affected. Thank you. Okay? So it is length dependent. Okay? It starts in the feet because there's the longest fibers. Then when it reaches up to the knee level, then it starts occurring in the fingers. If it happens much sooner in the fingers, always think of something else. Okay? Cervical cord lesion, or whatever it may be. Okay, carpal tunnel, like you said, but I always think of other causes. If it affects the hands first and not the feet, or if it affects the hands much quicker. So, this is the IDF guidelines. We said to do it on four areas one, two, three, four. If they don't feel one of the four, they've got neuropathy. Okay, test on both the feet always because neuropathy can start on one feet first and it can start on the second feet after months or even years later. So, always test both the feet. And if you test it once and they could feel it, you can then test it after one year. Okay? And that's also the guidelines. Yeah? So, the next one is testing for vibration. Do you want to? One of you? So, how many types of tuning fork we have? How many types of tuning fork we have? Yeah, we've got 64, 128, 256, and 512. Okay? The evidence is for the 128 hertz tuning fork. Okay, we don't use 64 because 64 is very jarring, okay? Anybody can feel it, even horses. Okay, so I think we should be careful that we don't use, because I know in our clinic there was once a 64 hertz and obviously people didn't know and, and, and I think we're probably under-diagnosing neuropathy if you use a 64 hertz tuning fork. So, 128 is the, is the, mm -hmm. is to be done. Do I meet? So when I, when I do it, I always first do it somewhere in the upper limb. So we give the patient a sensation. Can you feel that? Yeah, okay. And then this, the, the evidence is for putting it on the tip of the toe, okay? That is how we do it, at least in the UK. Some people, especially neurologists, will go to do it on the, on the bony prominence, okay? On the bony prominence, but the research that we have done, we, and that's not the way to do it, okay? He gets an audio clue, okay? So you put it on the tip of the toe. Can you feel that? Okay? You can do this two ways. Um, you can either hit it, you put on the toe, and then you stop it. And you ask the patient, has he stopped feeling it? Remember, patients like to please their doctors. So when you do that, he'll say, yes, I can feel it. Probably he's got dense neuropathy. Because he knows you're doing it, and he will then say, yes, he can feel it. So either you stop it, 
and ask him to tell you when he stops feeling it. If he says yes immediately, then we know he doesn't have neuropathy, okay? Or I will hit it, I will stop it, and I put on the toe. So it's not vibrating, but the patient doesn't know that, okay? Double blind randomized control trial, okay? So hit it, stop it, put on the toe. Okay, and the patient says yes, then, yeah, then he's, he's not telling the truth, okay? And then to do two, three times that way. And of course, again, do it on both the toes. You don't have to go all the way up because they don't feel the toe on the toe. They've got neuropathy. You may want to find uh, up to what level is affected. You don't have to do it, but some people like doing it. So that's fine. You can go from the toe, medial malleolus, you know, and go all the way up, okay? But you don't have to do it. And that's partly because it is time consuming. The more time you spend examining the feet, patient gets tired out, you get tired out, and then you don't have time to do the other examination. So just doing on the tip of the toe actually probably is more than enough. Okay. Oh, can we switch back again, please? Okay, temperatures and uh, vibration. Come on, you can do the VPT now. <laughs> so all the guidelines do not recommend doing the VPT, okay? Because the VPT, you require a current source, the machine is expensive and is cumbersome to carry around. So we do not recommend in using the VPT. The VPT is used only mainly in clinical settings or in bigger centers, okay? Okay. Okay, we'll continue, we'll come back to that. Then, of course, the other one we can do is temperature sensation, okay? So we, we check hot and cold, okay? Normally, what temperature differential you should be able to make out? If I put one temperature and I put a different temperature on your toe, normally, what difference in temperature should you be able to make out? Yeah, one to two degrees, okay? But most of the um, um, evidence is seven degrees up and down, which I think is a bit too much, okay? So we use the tip term. Go on, go and do it, yeah. Okay, well, so we use the tip term, okay? One has got a metal end, one has got a plastic end, okay? So this is cold and this is not cold. It's not warm, but it's not cold. So you touch the patient there and ask him, just say hot or cold, okay? Cold, 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 hot, hot, cold, hot. You keep changing. It's always good not to give hot, cold, hot, cold, because then the patient will know and patient will lie to you, okay? Because patients want, you, want to please you, okay? So always do it alternating, but not, not Hot, hot, cold, cold that way. Okay, go on. I don't think you can see from there, but go on. How do you? Remember that corner So the the VPT goes from zero to fifty volts, and you can turn up the dial. Touch vibration you have to tell me what's going on. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes. Just let me know. Sometimes, sometimes, you have to sign. What? Sorry. Yes. How much? How much was it? It's around three. Three. Yes. Okay. See that? It's three for him. He can feel it. Yes. So normally, what we would do again, we would just put it on the top of the toe. Actually, we would just drop it like that and let the machine drop its weight on the toe. So okay. we're not pushing. Right. Are they, are they giving him pressure sensation? 
So we just let it drop lightly, go to zero, and then go up now. Ask him so to so then you can feel. Three? Yeah. Okay. So then what I would do is, so he can feel that seven. Okay. So I would then go up to fifteen because I know he's definitely feeling it. Then I'll turn it down and I'll ask him to tell me when he can stop feeling it. Again, double blind. Okay. So then I know if he stops around seven or eight that he told me correct the first time round. Okay. So go up and then go down again. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And then the pain sensation, again, um, using um, um, a, a, a pin uh, which, which will not be too sharp so it doesn't cause bleeding to occur, okay? So that also, so we call it a neuro tip. And then ankle reflexes. Ankle reflex, again, is very difficult to do. A lot of people do it not in the right way, but also people who are elderly, people who have edema, those uh, who are on certain drugs like beta blockers, they may not you may not get a good ankle reflex. So ankle reflex really is not one of the things that we have put into the guidelines because it is done so badly even by, by, by consultants, okay? So we don't do, but it is there and if people can't, if you, if you can't elicit an ankle reflex, then you've got to do with the reinforcement. It's time consuming, you know, do you want to do all that, you know? And then patients usually keep the muscle too tense and then you don't, so it is there to, to, if you want to do it, but really we don't recommend that in the guidelines, okay? So what we need is a good history, uh, and ha there'll be signs of neuropathy, but usually no symptoms. 30 to 50 percent of people will have symptoms. They can have pain uh, commonly. But of course, what's important is to rule out other causes for the neuropathy. About 10 percent of people with diabetes who have neuropathy will have other causes, okay? Drugs, malignancy, vitamin deficiency, alcohol, etc. And we know that once somebody gets neuropathy, there's no treatment for the neuropathy. It just progresses year on year. But if there's a cause and we treat it, we can actually improve the neuropathy, okay? Especially in India, people are on tuberculous treatment, okay? That can cause neuropathy, B12 deficiency, et cetera. So we have to be careful that we don't miss it on that. So what we need, therefore, is a comprehensive foot uh, assessment, okay? And that will then reduce amputations. So we need to do a foot assessment comprehensively and then risk categorize the patient. Okay, I showed you the slide earlier. You go to risk categorize, is the patient risk zero, one, two, or three? Then you manage the foot problem preventatively. We, what we do want is patient to get a foot ulcer and then we say, no, we should probably treat this patient you know, actively. We should prevent the patient from getting the foot ulcer in the first place. Self-education is important and self-inspection, okay? There's a study done in America where they gave patients a monofilament and told them to check their feet, check the sensation every day. And they found that people who gave, who they gave the monofilament had less ulcers. Do you think the monofilament caused less ulcers? They were checking their feet every day because they were putting the monofilament. So they were having a look at the feet. They then gave them a temperature device they found similar results with the temperature. So daily examination of the feet is important, okay? So I tell my patients every day, either morning or evening, make it a habit. You go for shower in the morning or you come from work in the evening, make it a habit to do the same day so you don't forget. If people can't look at their feet, because sometimes it is difficult to look underneath, you get a spouse or a carer. Or they can put a mirror on the floor and they just run their foot over the mirror and they look into the mirror, okay? The different ways that we can do it, but you have to tell the patient how to do it, otherwise they won't know what to do, okay? And of course then offloading is important, giving the right footwear to patients. If they've got callus, taking off the callus, okay? Because when people walk on the callus, what happens? They bleed into the callus. When they bleed into the callus, it then blows out into an ulcer, okay? So an ulcer is a callus that has been walked upon, okay? So it's important that we take off the callus and give them good footwear to prevent the callus from breaking down. And of course, again, I keep stressing on this, you know, hyperglycemia management is very important, um, and also other treatment and symptom management. If they've got pain, treating the pain is important, improving the quality of. Ultimately, what we're looking at is not only preventing amputation, which is, is important, but also quality of life. 
you have patients coming to clinic with severe pain in their feet, okay? And they say, doctor, I want my leg taken off. And I think something that's what you need to do because if they have the leg and they can't have a normal life, okay, they've got an ulcer, they've got osteomyelitis, you know, you're trying to preserve the foot, but then they have no quality of life, okay? But if they, if they have the amputation, you give them a false limb, they can go back to normal work. They can, they can walk about, which normally, if they've got an ulcer, you may ask them not to walk, okay? So this is another thing that we do in the, in, in the UK. It's called touch the toe test. Who have, who have you heard of touch the toe test? Nobody? So what happens in, uh, at least in our hospital is that we have a monofilament, okay? It's all bent because somebody's got bored and they've been, like you play with the, um, with the paper clip, huh? you, play with, you play with the paper clip, isn't it? So they play with the monofilament and it gets all bent. Or they take it home, they put it in the pocket and they take it home, okay? But you've always got your hands with you, isn't it? So this study was done in Ipswich where they said, let us do touch the toe test, okay? And we will see if it is as good as using a monofilament or using a biothesiometer. So what they did is they told the patient, close their eyes, we will touch six toes at random, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six. And if they can't feel two of the six touches, then they have got neuropathy, okay? So all you got to do is just touch the toe, okay? We call it feather light touch. Patient's eyes are closed, but before that you do it on the finger so they know what you're doing. Then they close the eyes and you just tell them, touch the toe. Can you feel it? Yes, no, yes, no, okay? Six times. If they don't feel two of them, they've got neuropathy. This is a really good uh, bedside test, especially in places where they don't have instruments. But in fact, now in the UK, in our hospital, this is now the guidelines. So we do touch the toe test. We don't have monofilaments. I told you they're expensive, they break down, people play with it, people throw it out, etc. So this is now part of the foot assessment in the UK and also in our hospital. The other one that we're using is the vibratip. Now how many of you have seen the vibratip? You seen it? Yeah? Is that a yes or a no? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the mark I can't make out. <laughs> Have you seen the, who's seen the vibrative? tip? No? Okay, I'll pass this around, okay? So it's a very simple device, okay? It is, um, it's got a battery inside, okay? So the battery is sitting there, and that's the tip that vibrates, okay? So you press the battery, and you put this on the toe, and you ask the patient if he can feel the vibration. So again, you will do it on the hand, okay? Always demonstrate somewhere else. Let the patient know what you're doing with the eyes open. Then they close the eyes and you put it on the tip of the toe. Okay? And you press it for about two seconds. Okay? This will last for about 6,000 touches and then the battery dies. Okay? I'll pass it around. So you just do on the tip of the toes. Okay? So in the UK, although we have it, it's not part of the guidelines. And the reason for that is because the trials have not shown that by doing this and a person can't feel the vibrative tip, they're at risk of foot ulceration. So when I sat on the NICE committee, they did ask for more research to be performed. Okay, you pass it, pass it down, yeah. So, so this is the study that was done, and it showed that using the vibrative tip is equivalent to using the Tenga monofilament or using the biothesiometer. So this study was done in, um, in Manchester, and then what we did um, is we took three groups, three, three healthcare professionals. So we had a doctor, we had a podiatrist, and we had a nurse. Because a lot of these patients are seen in primary care by the practice nurse, not by the GP, not by a doctor, okay? Or he's seen, or the patient's seen by a podiatrist. So what we wanted to see was, by using this particular device, will we get the same results if it's done by a doctor, a nurse, or a podiatrist? And we actually found that with this device, we did much better comparing the three healthcare professionals than using a monofilament, okay? And I think that's partly because of the way people use the monofilament and probably other reasons also, which I won't go into. But this is a device that can be used, and I know that this device is available in India. Um, so um, 
but anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a good device to use. Okay, so now we come to peripheral disease, okay? Again, a very common complication in diabetes, a very common reason for people to undergo amputation. Neuropathy doesn't give lead to amputations, okay? It is the foot ulcer because of neuropathy which gets infected, they get, get osteomyelitis, then they have an amputation. But PAD by itself can lead to amputations, okay? So which is why we need to prevent it because you can see the prevalence is quite high, especially in the elderly. The older somebody one gets, the greater the chances of them having PAD. But not only that, they also have other cardiovascular events. So people with PAD have renal artery stenosis, people with PAD have cardiovascular disease and strokes. So there is a link, okay, because after this is all one tree, isn't it, the, the, the arteries. So what's happening in the legs also happens in other parts of the body. So how do we assess? Do you want to show them how to defeat? So we check two pulses, okay? We check the dorsalis speedis. And the dorsalis speedis is present between the first and the second metatarsal heads. 10% of people, it is present laterally. 10% of people are born without the dorsalis speedis, okay? So it can be absent in some people. Whereas the posterior tibial artery is present behind the medial malleolus and it is present in everybody. Okay? Can you feel it? I don't think he's showing. So people with type 1 diabetes need to have their feet examined for neuropathy, etc. at five years people with type 2 diabetes from diagnosis. And why is that? Why type 2 from diagnosis? Anybody? Correct, because we think that people with type 2 have had hyperglycemia for five to eight years. UKPDS study has shown that. So they already have underlying cardiovascular disease and also PAD, maybe also neuropathy, which is why they say that foot examination in type 2 from diagnosis in type 1 from five years onwards. Okay, thank you. you. Want to switch the slides, please? So, dorsalis speedis on the um, top of the foot, posterior tibial behind the medial malleolus. Okay, then you check the, the um, brachial pressure and you, you do ankle brachial index. Okay, normal is 0.9 to 1.3. More than 1.3 the blood vessels are calcified, less than 0.9, they've got peripheral disease. 0.9 to 0.7, some say 0.6, it is mild. 0.6 to 0.4, it is moderate, less than 0.4, critical limb ischemia. So those patients should be referred urgently to the vascular surgeons. So other tests, if, if, if you can't feel the pulses or if, um, if it is calcified, you can do two brachial index, uh, duplex scans, of course, also vascular imaging. Okay, so that is slightly more sophisticated, which you can't obviously do in the foot clinic. So this is what we did for the IDF guidelines. This is the risk categorization. And if you go to Google, you put IDF diabetic foot guidelines, um, you, you'll, you'll get the guidelines. Okay, so it is right there. So treatment is important for vascular disease. Okay, important to do, um, as always, for any condition, lifestyle changes, regular exercise. There have been lots of studies shown that if people walk, 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 they can double their walking distance after some time, okay? Because walking increases collateral blood flow in the legs. So making people walk, but the trials that were done were supervised. They were done on treadmill, okay? Again, that's something which we, we don't have, patients won't have access to. But I think making patients walk, so what I tell them, walk till you get the pain, stop for a few minutes, pain subsides, walk again, and keep doing that. And the more you do it, the longer you do it, the better it gets, and they can walk much longer then. Medical therapies, yes, so we should look at statins, blood pressure control, of course, diabetes control, anti-thrombotic therapy, aspirin or clopidogrel. But you heard the COMPASS study? Have you heard about the COMPASS study? There were patients who had PAD, and they gave them rivaroxaban. 
on a low dose rivaroxaban with aspirin. Okay, that's the dose. Aspirin once a day, rivaroxaban twice a day. And they showed reduction in amputation by 70% and reduction in other limb complications by 46%. But also they showed reduction in cardiovascular events. Okay, so people with PAD who come to my clinic, while we are waiting for them to go to the vascular surgeons to get the angiogram done, etc., I will put them on aspirin plus rivaroxaban. And many of my patients are elderly and they can't undergo revascularization. Or they've had it before, it's blocked again, and then the surgeons say, we can't do any more. So then we can give them this combination. So that is standard practice now uh, in the UK where we give them aspirin plus rivaroxaban. And we have got really good evidence, okay? So I think that is something that we should be looking at. Okay, quickly, foot ulcers. How many of you all here do foot clinics? Oh, not that many. So you all don't see foot patients, is it? Ah, okay. So the practice in the UK, you know, is different. All the clinics are run by diabetologists. But in Europe, it is run by either orthopedic surgeons or vascular surgeons. But here, there's vascular surgeons. So once somebody gets an ulcer, they go to the vascular clinic, is it? Is that safe? Is that safe? So if they get a foot ulcer, they go to the vascular surgeons. Okay. Because what surgeons want to do, what, what surgeons get paid to do? Yes. Because what, the, what, what, why, why does the surgeon get paid? He gets paid to take the leg off, not to preserve the leg. If he saves the foot, he makes no money. Correct? Yeah. I think the clinic should be run by diabetologists. That is standard practice in the UK, by the way, except in a few small centers. Otherwise, standard practice is run by diabetologists. Because we can do, we can do all this, you know, lifestyle, glucose monitoring, lipid control, blood pressure. Okay, and that is paramount, you know, we can do this also. Now, of course, surgeons are doing it, some of our surgeons are doing this, but, you know, it should be run by, and we should, so what we do, we, I run the clinic with my podiatrist and my diabetes specialist nurse. If I need a vascular surgeon, I'll call into my clinic. If I need an orthopedic surgeon because they need a toe amputation or, or more than toe amputation, or they've got charcoal foot and they need the, 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 you know, pins or plates putting in, then I would get the orthopedic surgeon. But otherwise, I see all the foot patients and all the GPs know that I'm in charge of the clinic. So anybody who has a foot ulcer, they will refer the patient to me. And we see the patients within 24 to 48 hours. We have clinics on every day. I'm not there every day, seen by the podiatrist. If they're worried, they will call me. And then we run two clinics a week, which is run by, by the diabetes doctors. So I think it is important that, that that's how it should be done. Um, so if somebody gets a foot ulcer, what you want to know is, is the foot ulcer because of neuropathy or because of peripheral disease? Because the treatment will change. The site of the ulcer will change, depending on where the ulcer is. Okay, does the patient have foot deformity? Again, it's important because foot deformity leads to pressure changes. And if somebody's got clawing of the toes and, and he's wearing shoes, it causes pressure here, okay? Or it can cause pressure here. The whole body weight is going on the tips of the toes because he's walking like this, okay? So then he might need corrective surgery. So it's important to examine the feet to see what foot deformity he has got and can that foot deformity be changed? So claw toes, hammer toes, and then charcoal foot. Also, if they've got deformities, then we will give them special footwear to accommodate the feet. Or I tell the patients to wear trainers, okay? Because trainers are malleable, okay? They've got good flexibility, and they don't cause that much pressure. So this is a patient who came to my clinic once, okay? She was working in uh, Marks & Spencer. She was a floor manager. And she wore this shoe, she had type 1 diabetes. What do you think happened to her feet? Hmm? I, what is it? Does she Shako. Uh, that's another story, another patient. <laughs> there, see. So we took the shoes off, and this is what her toes were looking like. So I told her that she can't go home in those shoes because 
she could lose her leg. She started crying. She said, I cannot not wear those shoes. I said, see what you've done to your feet. So patients are reluctant to change practice, you know, and that's something that we have to be telling them and tell them once, twice, 10 times, maybe 100 times. If I remember right, I think she lost her toes then, these two toes, you know, she was only 31 years old. Okay, so you don't want this to happen. So, another story. If somebody loses their first toe, what happens? Oops, sorry. If somebody loses their first toe, what will happen? Yeah. If they lose their fifth toe, what will happen? Nothing much. It won't look nice, but it won't change the pressure. It won't change the, the foot shape. If they lose their first toe, what happens? So when you walk, where do you put your maximum pressure? On your first peritussal head, you know? So if you take this toe out, these four toes, which are the minor toes, are now bearing the whole weight of the body. So what can happen to these four toes? They can go sh undergo Charcot changes. We had a few cases like this, and the study from, um, from Denmark by Per Holstein, if you, if you heard of Per Holstein, they looked at 140 patients. 15% of patients who had Charcot had because they had their first toe removed. So we try our utmost best to try and save the first toe. It's very, very important. If they lose the first, second toes, it's not that important other than it may change the foot shape slightly, it may not look very nice, but it will not cause the problems that will happen if somebody loses the first toe. Okay, so we need to try and save the first toe at all costs. So the triad for foot ulceration, neuropathy, stroke, PAD, deformity, and trauma. If somebody's got neuropathy, they will not get an ulcer unless if trauma is involved. Okay, so we did a study in Manchester where we, um, where we uh, went to the, um, the foot shops selling footwear in Manchester. We asked them, if somebody comes to you and has got, um, and wants a, sh a shoe and they've got diabetes, how will you advise them? They said, we just let them wear the shoe and tell them if they can fit it or not, if they can feel the shoe. Then we did this study with people with neuropathy and we asked them, how would you buy a pair of shoes? How would you buy a pair of shoes? You know, we don't, when you go to the shoe shop, we don't measure our feet, isn't it? We just put the foot in the shoe. It's comfortable. It's comfortable. That's how you would buy it. Okay, in the evening. But you put your foot in, it's comfortable. So a person with neuropathy goes to buy a pair of shoes. What shoe size will you buy, you think? No, two size smaller. Why? Because when they put their shoe in the foot, uh, their, their foot in the shoe, they can't feel it because they've got neuropathy. So they will buy a shoe that is tight and they get deep pressure sensation. Ah, now that's a nice fit. So what happens is they've got edema because of neuropathy and they've got tight fitting shoes. Ulceration, isn't it? Yeah. So people with neuropathy, you're right, they should buy the shoes in the evening because that's when the leg is swollen, but they must have their feet measured. And in the UK, some shops, they will not only measure the length, they'll also measure the breadth. Okay, so you get size 9G. Okay, 9 is the length, G is how wide it is. And I think that's, that's, that's the word. So we went around training all the foot shops, uh, footwear shops in Manchester. We've been asking them, and we've told them how to you know, provide footwear to patients. Okay. So these are type of ulcers, neuropathic plantar, your ischemic on the on the uh, sorry ischemic on the toe tips, um, and your ischemic is on the lateral, the watershed zone. Okay, remember if an ulcer occurs here, it is your ischemic. Okay, because that's the watershed zone. So another important thing is it's probe to toe probe to bone test. Okay, how many of you all do probe to bone test if you got an ulcer patient? So the important thing is when you put the metal probe and you hit it, this is the sound you will hear. That means you're hitting bone, okay? If you're hitting bone, there's an 85% chance that the person has got underlying osteomyelitis, okay? So you would then do an x-ray. Um, I thought I had it somewhere. It'll come back. You do an x-ray to pick up for, for, neuro, for osteomyelitis, okay? Remember, infection is a common cause for amputation. And this is the urodial steady again. 
and infection is a very highly prevalent in people with foot ulcers. In this study, 58% of ulcers were infected, 58%. Okay, so we have to look for infection and treat infection appropriately. Okay, I think we ran out of time. Is that correct? So this is the IDSA guidelines for infection, mild, moderate, and severe. The very the simple thing is, does the patient have cellulitis or not? If it is no cellulitis, it is mild infection. If it is uh, two to five centimeters, it is moderate. More than that, it is severe infection, okay? So it is important to look at the, uh, the extent of the cellulitis spreading out of the wound, and that way you can categorize, is it mild, moderate, or severe? Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip to these. Um, so, uh, so how to diagnose osteomyelitis? Remember, if somebody has got an ulcer that's been there for more than four weeks, always suspect underlying osteomyelitis. Anybody with long-standing ulcers, I will do an X-ray. If I if it's broke to bone, X-ray is normal. I will do an MRI scan because an MRI scan is very sensitive and very specific. Okay, it is the best way to pick up osteomyelitis. This is expensive, so we don't do it in everybody. If this clear-cut X-ray changes, we won't do an MRI. Although the surgeons say, do an MRI, because then we don't know how, how far up their leg we have to go. So you can see the bone is infected. Why you want an MRI scan? But they always insist on it, okay? But you don't have to do it because it is costly, especially when patients are paying for it themselves. So offloading is important. Take out the callus. Remember what Paul Brand said? It's not what you put into an ulcer. It is what you take out. You take out the pressure and you take out the callus. Okay, the two important things you need to treat the wound. So debridement is so important. Offloading is important. Total contact cast is the gold standard. You can use other ways of offloading, but the TCC is the gold standard. And if done properly, it does help the wound to heal. So this is the empirical treatment for foot ulcer infection. We published this paper a few years ago. I don't think it's changed that much. Um, if a patient has got mild infection, you can give oral antibiotics. If they've got moderate to severe infections, you may want to give IV antibiotics, maybe even admit the patient to hospital. It's good to know what is the uh, organisms causing infection and the, um, the uh, sensitivity pattern of the organisms. So we do regular audits in, in our hospital, and I'm sure other places also do it. So we know if all our bugs are resistant to flucloxacillin, we probably will not use it for a while, and then they become sensitive again, okay? Somebody stop now? I'll stop? Okay, sorry guys, I can't finish, but thank you so much, and thank you for coming. Yeah. <laughs>